Are you looking to refine your sales team and increase your company's revenue? Leading your sales team is an ongoing improvement process. Join Harry Newhan from Eric Lofholm International as he interviews top sales managers in the world. Discover the best practices that rocket them and their teams towards success. Boost your recruitment, motivation, and training techniques, leading you to build a top-producing synergetic sales team. Welcome to CSI for Sales Managers. Well, hello, everybody. Harry Newhan here with Continuous Sales Improvement for Sales Managers and Best Practices. We're here with Randy Caruana out of Wisconsin, and Randy's our special guest today, and we're going to have a little little fireside chat here with Randy and get to know him a little bit and find out some of the secrets that he's uh, been hiding behind the, the hidden curtain there. And, and uh, no, just kidding. We're just going to have fun. And uh, Randy's going to be our special guest here through the, uh, through the half hour or so. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Randy, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, a little bit about who you are. What's your background a little bit? Well, thanks, Harry. Um, so I'm a Canadian that, that ended up in Wisconsin about 20 years ago. Um, so it was a uh, nice, nice transition for me, uh, both for me and my family. Uh, we, we love Wisconsin. We love the Midwest. Um, and, and to be honest with you, there wasn't a, a huge amount of difference between, you know, living in, because uh, we, we were north of Toronto, uh, Ontario versus Wisconsin. So the transition's been great. Um, my daughter is married to a Wisconsinite now, so it's official. We're staying in Wisconsin, and uh, it looks like that's just the way it's going to be for the next little while. That there's nothing wrong with that. Is, Wisconsin is that the the state of the Thousand Lakes or is that Minnesota? That's Minnesota. What's Wisconsin uh, known for? The cheese, uh, cheeseheads, cheeseheads. There you and go. And the Packers and the Packers and the. So you must be a Packers fan, right? I'm a Packer fan. I was a Packer fan before I came to Wisconsin. So that's pretty good. I'm uh, I'm here in Michigan in the Detroit area, so we uh, we have kind of fun because. Uh, the Upper Peninsula in Michigan is attached, obviously, to Wisconsin. We border mm -hmm. your your neighbors of ours, yep. and um, we actually little. You know, I'm digressing a little bit, sorry, but we gave up the rights to Toledo, and for that, the United States gave us the Upper Peninsula. So when we go up there, we feel like we're in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that was a great deal, but anyway. Not for Wisconsin, it wasn't. <laughs> no, it no, wasn't. No. Not at all. No. Um, but anyway, so again, just having a little fun there. So what do you uh, what do you actually do? Tell us about your your company, what your role is, um, how many how many salespeople you have, because we're, we're talking to sales managers out there around the world. And uh, we want to obviously get into some other questions, but tell us a little bit about your 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 work environment, your background. Sure. So, so in the U.S., I, I run sales um, for all channels, all products, but I'm also responsible for the Americas uh, and then Asia Pacific. So I've got general managers in Latin America, general manager in Canada, and a general manager in Australia that looks after the APAC region for me. So, you know, from a direct responsibility, obviously I work day to day with our general managers, the U.S. develops best practices, and then we take those really good skill sets and we try to transfer them to the region because the markets are are very different. Um, they're different focus, different product, different customer base. So we try to take what we can and try to replicate the best practices wherever we go. Wow, that's great. Now, how long has your company been in business? Uh, we're celebrating 83 years. Wow, 83 years. And obviously, you're not the founder. I'm not the founder. No. So Carl Keekafer was the founder. There you go. Um, and how long have you been with them? I've been with Mercury combined 23 years. 23. Now, did you start off as a salesperson on the bottom and work your way up? Uh, that's an interesting story. So I started <laughs> off I started off working for Mercury in Ontario uh -huh. in the warehouse. Really? And yeah, and then when I graduated college, I got a sales coordinator position at Mercury. Uh, with the intent of, of being a field guy. I wanted to be a field sales guy. And uh, I had two opportunities to go out in the field. And you were talking about the North. Both opportunities were in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Wow. And I had the pleasure of visiting Winnipeg, Manitoba. And I said, you know what? I'll stay in Ontario for now. Wait for the next opportunity. <laughs> the next opportunity didn't arise. Um, so I left Mercury. And mm -hmm. I went and ran a dealership, uh, a marina. Uh, that sold both Mercury and Yamaha, and I did that for two years. Uh, just general management, a couple locations. Great learning curve for me because you're on the other side of it, right? You're trying to deal with all these reps coming in and 
uh, it was a it was a growing um, experience for me uh, the two years, and then I left the dealership to go work for Yamaha. Wow. Uh, I ran their marine division in Canada for ten years, uh, and then I, I decided that I wanted to transfer to the U.S. And there was there was some difficulties in doing that at Yamaha. Um, Yamaha Canada didn't want me to leave. Yamaha U.S. wanted me to quit and get rehired. And I decided, you know what, uh, I'm just in the middle of this. So I started looking for some other opportunities. So I left Yamaha and I went to Honda. Ran their marine power equipment division. Um, and I'll be honest with you, at the time, you know, I have a love for auto. And I thought, well, if I'm working for an automotive company, I can maybe negotiate my way into the automotive <laughs> business. So after two years, I did a great job in marine. And they said, you're doing such a great job. We want you to run motorcycle. And I'm like, I'm out. I need to move on. Wow. Um, and at the time, Mercury asked me to come back in Canada. So I came back and I ran sales and marketing in Canada for about three years. And then I transferred to Wisconsin, uh, actually to a product position. And I was responsible for uh, the product development of all the product that is developed in Wisconsin. And did that for a couple of years, then did sales and marketing uh, for the U.S. And then eventually ended up in the role that I'm in today. So kind of a, a colorful background. You know, what's exciting about that background, Randy, the authenticity of it is it, it's not as uncommon as so many uh, managers journey. Yeah. You know, the, the journey and the evolution of our, our continuous improvement over time. Yeah. And it's, it's like you keep plugging away and, and you keep building on those skills Yep. And opportunities seem to open up uh, as yeah. we go through it. So thank you for yeah. sharing that. We appreciate that. So one of the business questions, what do you feel in this journey that you took? And even now, what do you feel the most important thing or tool or skill um, that you have learned about sales management? Yep. And, and, and I'm going to go back to early on in my career. And I probably didn't even realize it back then. Um but there was a couple just simple things that they just drove into you. And it was really at Honda. And it was all about, you know, PDCA, cap due. And at the time, I used to get so frustrated. It's like, you know, this total quality management thing's just killing me, right? And at the time, I thought, you know what? I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to try to understand it and try to learn why they feel it's so important. And over the years, it's kind of stuck with me. And I, I find myself using it over and over and over again, especially when you're managing a sales team, because, you know, ready, aim, fire isn't typically the way sales guys act, right? It's usually ready, fire, aim. So we spend a lot of time, you know, not only working with them to understand, you know, what is the goal, but more importantly, do you really think it's achievable? Do you have a plan? you know, how do you think you're going to get there? And, and in most cases, they have a vision, they have a goal, they don't really have a plan. And and most people don't succeed because they don't have a roadmap and or their goal is not attainable. So, you know, some of those practices that I developed 20 years ago or 25 years ago now have stuck with me. So when we when we set a target for our sales team, you know, the first question I ask our directors is, okay, how are you going to get there? And, and first of all, how did you come up with a target? And they kind of look at each other. Oh, we just picked a number. Well, <laughs> then how do you know it's achievable? Wow. You know, so that conversation, it turns into the five whys, but it, it really does spin a nice conversation where you're starting to understand you need to go back and either revise the target or revise the plan. So, I know that's a long way around answering the question. Uh, planning is so critical. If you want to achieve a goal, you have to have a plan. And and sales guys like to run. Um, you know, they they think they're accomplishing things and they think they're going to solve all the world's problems. But they end up at the end of the year kind of scratching their head saying, ah, I missed the target. I don't know why. That's because you didn't have a plan. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. First of all, before I get into my comment on that, you mentioned Honda's quality, quality control and quality management. I've been driving Honda for many, many years, and I, I it's usually the CRV. Uh, it's my mm -hmm. third or fourth one, and each of them I've taken over two hundred thousand miles. And 
that quality management that you learn at such a young age in that uh, is what's made Honda's brand so powerful. Yeah. And I would and, agree. Yeah, and, and for you to take that to where you're at, that's a huge asset for you because so often that's the biggest challenge. And I live in Detroit and I'm driving a foreign car, mm -hmm. but you, you go out to different areas of the country and you'll see a lot of people driving foreign cars because of the reputation of that quality control is such, such a high level. So appreciate yeah. that. And to answer your question, or not to answer, but the comment um, about the action and about the, the strategy, we have a, an acronym uh, that I learned from, from uh, my partner, Eric, and it's Goal, Strategy, Action, GSA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have the goal, but then you're right. If you don't have a strategy on how to achieve it, it's yeah, just a number out of thin air. It. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. It's, it's, it's more validation. So let's talk about along that, that line as far as finding the people that can fit into those roles. What, what is your best idea or best strategy or best practice on recruiting the talent that you want to or think that you want to work with and that you think can take you to where you want to go? You know, that's, that's an interesting question because I'd say it's changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, you know, if I look at the sales team that I started with eight to 10 years ago, um, they weren't data-driven. Um, it was all relationship building, hardcore selling. Um, let's hit the, hit the road and try to figure out what we can drum up for business. And when we reorganized, basically due to the last recession, um, they basically gave me a clean sheet and said, you need to redesign the sales team. And I said, okay, it starts with a circle. And the circle is data management, market intelligence, because we were lacking that. Uh, we, did, we just didn't have the resources that allowed us to make decisions based on data. And, and today we are 100% data driven. So as a result, we're looking for different attributes um, in an individual when it comes to a sales person. Because, you know, you still got to have the relationship building. You got to have the passion for sales, the passion for winning. But you got to be able to really take data, develop what the insights are, and really start insight selling versus just trying to hardcore sell. Uh, a typical sales guy, I, I remember five or six years ago when we told the guys, you got to drive by a customer sometimes because they're never going to amount to more than what they do today. Spend the time with those customers that are really going to develop the business and take you to the next level. And they're like, we've been told for 20 years, you never drive by a customer. Well, I'm not saying you drive by them all the time, but you need to focus on those key players that are really going to help you win in the marketplace. And as a result, we, we look for those skill sets now every day when we hire somebody, you know, do you have that capability to discover what the insights are? Can you see an opportunity and turn it into a plan can you get a customer to see it like you see it? And it's a different skill set today than what it was five or six years ago because you need to take the data and, and, and develop it to basically develop a plan. And there, there are people that struggle with that. Um, they can see the data. They can tell you what the data is, but they can't really tell you what the data tells you. And I think that skill set's different. Yeah, yeah. For, for for those of us that are in different industries, when you say drive by, tell tell us about what that actually means in your industry and in your business. So we have about five thousand dealers um, across the U.S., and we only have about sixteen uh, sales managers in the field. So a typical salesperson has between five and seven hundred accounts. You can't see every account every day, right? And in typical salesman fashion, you create a loop. And you basically stop and see as many as you can until Friday, and then you turn around and drive home. And, and we told our guys, you know, we, we're going to categorize our dealers into three buckets, silver, gold, and platinum, to try to understand, you know, where is the growth potential? Where are the opportunities? And we told them point blank, the silver group, we're going to manage from internal now. Our account reps that are internal are going to manage the silver group. And our gold and our platinum guys, you need to focus on. That's excellent. Now, when you're doing this uh, recruiting and when you're looking for the people that have that, that, that mindset, 
I, I've heard that some companies use um, some kind of uh, personality assessments or sales mm -hmm. assessments. Do you have any kind of testing or any kind of assessment protocol that you have in place or outside or inside your firm that helps you identify those, those key people? Yeah, so typically what we do, we don't do a personality assessment. We just do that through our regular interview process. Okay. But we typically ask uh, somebody from our market intelligence team to do some role playing with data. So we will basically give them a, uh, a competing, an area where dealers compete with each other is called a market trading area for us. Yeah. And we'll give them a scenario where it's real data. Uh, you've got three dealers in this market trade area. This is what's going on. What do you see going on based on the data that you, that you know today? And they would try to break it down and try to understand by asking the right questions. And you could tell very, very quickly the guys that actually look at it, guys and women, that look at it and say, oh, I think this is what's going on. I would probably ask the dealer this question. And they get it on the spot. But other guys are like, I haven't got a clue. I really don't know. It's just a bunch of data. It looks like we're losing share. That's all I can tell you. The insight uh, capability is really, really critical because it just shows how effective they're going to be in the marketplace in working with some of these complex situations. Now, is that something that can be learned or taught, or do you just kind of shy away from that person? If they have yeah. other attributes and they're stronger in other areas, and that's their weak point, is that somebody that you might consider still bringing on, or is that somebody that you just rather move on to somebody else? I, I would say it's a lot easier if you can see that capability up front. Gotcha. But we have learned with some of our existing staff that it can be taught, and it really revolves around confidence. In most cases, they're afraid to ask the right question or test a, uh, a, a, a type of thinking because they're not confident enough. So we're trying to get them the confidence that they can go into a customer and ask the appropriate questions. In many cases, they don't need to understand everything that's going on. They just need to ask the right questions because the customer is going to tell you what the answers are. And typically, if they have the confidence to ask those questions, they walk out with the answers and then they develop a plan around that. That's awesome. Thank you for that. The next one is, um, is a fun one. It's, it's motivation. What do you find is your most successful idea and best practice to motivate not, not only your managers that you deal with in different locations, but also the salespeople, if it's different. If it's the same, that's fine. But how about motivation? Where do you find your best practices there? Yeah, so we, we do a bunch of things just to keep people engaged. And um, right now we're going through a, a very interesting situation. We're oversold. We're oversold on product. The market's just crazy right now. Wow. And that, and that could be just as demotivating <laughs> as not having enough sales because now you're determining winners and losers, who gets the product and all that. We constantly have some fun by just creating competitions, little competitions within the group. You know, either it's one channel or another, one region or another. Salespeople want to win. Yeah. And they're so competitive. Yeah. So we have fun with it and 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 we'll give out little awards. They're, they're not really meaningful awards, but the fact that they won the star or they won something, you know, it gives them bragging credibility and they just absolutely love it. So we're constantly trying to come up with different ideas that really creates a competition. Um and, and in most cases, we'll look at the guys that are kind of getting beaten down a little bit. And we'll group them with some guys that are having some great success in the marketplace because it rubs off. Yeah. And it gets them motivated and it just keeps them engaged. Y you can't keep on losing uh, because you will get pretty depressed. So we always try to create a situation where everybody can win and everybody can brag a little bit. That's good. Now, do you when you do your, um, we call it friendly competition. Yep. And um, when you do that, do you do it monthly, quarterly, annually, or a combination of all? We typically do it quarterly. Okay. Um, all their incentives are, are based on a quarterly um, target. Yeah. So we try to get them engaged. And then we also try to include the inside staff as well. Um, so they have to team up with their counterparts in the field and they basically team up. So you see the bannering back and forth in the office and it's just hilarious. That's We've cool. done some crazy things before. We've done kind of ham trackers and uh, for the internal staff where the winner gets a, you know, a, a side of ham. Um it's the same thing. And, and I would say the inside sales people 
are more competitive than the field style. Really? They're just incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. That, that's it kind is. of fun. It actually sounds it fun. Is. It is. And yeah. it's, it, it, it's, it's not a big thing, but you know, from even from a company standpoint, it, it doesn't cost us a lot of money, but the, the, um, the energy it drives within the office. I mean, we've seen people come in at five o'clock in the morning. They're working till nine o'clock at night to get caught up. And we're like, what are you doing here? Well, I, I need to get ahead of this other team. They're creeping ahead. And it's just incredible. The energy it drives. Yeah, that's a, uh, a camaraderie building uh, atmosphere. That's, yeah. um, that, that's exciting. Thank you for, for that idea. The next one is um, to kind of go along with our title, continuous sales improvement for mm -hmm. sales managers. Do you offer or encourage any kind of continuing education or continuing um, training, either on, on site or off site? Kind of like realtors, they have to go through a continuing education class to get recertified every year. Same thing with mortgage brokers and so forth. You may not have to get certified, but do you, do you offer any kind of continuous uh, improvement courses like that or outside? We don't formally. Um, we have a few individuals that will take a course probably about every year to 18 months, usually a sales uh, focused course. Uh, but, but I would say the one thing that we do almost every sales meeting, so twice a year, we typically try to do some training. And the training can include you know, role playing from a, from a sales standpoint, product training, um, because we find that our field staff just love to learn about product and they want to get ahead of things and try to really be kind of the expert in their field. But the third one is uh, we'll pick a specific area of data of either market or um, anything that our market intelligence group's working on and we'll try to make sure they're really up to speed. Uh, the last one we did was on consumer mosaics. So we went out and bought a bunch of mosaic information to try to understand how do we use this in the field? And so we train them on, here's the data set. This is the data that you guys can run with. What elements do you really want to become good at? And it really opened their eyes as to the number or the, the quantity of data that we could get to help our dealers and help our builders try to identify where their customers are who their customer is today, and how do they grow their business. And that's something we're rolling out slowly now through our market intelligence group. And it's been an absolute home run because the wealth of information is just incredible. Yeah, just the fact that you can get your hands on that kind of data is, is it puts you in a competitive advantage, in my opinion, puts you in a competitive advantage yes. because you, you, know what, you know what your target is. Absolutely. And you can see it a whole lot clearer. And yeah. clarity is, is so important. Um, you mentioned your sales... I couldn't understand. Trainings or meetings twice a year? What were those? We do sales meetings twice a year where meetings, we get everybody okay. together. Yeah. Okay. And do you, when you do that, do you bring in outside trainers as a special guest? Is it a one-day thing, a weekend thing? How, how does that work? Typically, we won't bring in a, a special guest uh, that is like a guest speaker. Yeah. We typically will bring in like a customer, a key customer oh. to address the group. Uh, we've had a couple speakers in the past. They've been hit or miss. Uh, but typically we try to bring a customer in to tell us the good, the bad, the ugly. How are we doing? You know, are, are, we, are we meeting what your requirements are? Are we servicing you properly? Are you getting the support you need? Um, it, we'll bring in a dealer. We'll bring in a builder. Uh, we brought in some consumers at different times. And it really helps our people understand a different point of view. Heck yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. It that, works that's very well. That's really good. Now, when you bring them in, do you bring them in from different regions or are they all local? Correct. Oh, okay. different channels, different channels, different regions. And, you know, typically they want to meet the staff anyways. Yeah. Uh, but it's great for our staff just to ask them some questions and to hear honestly, you know, how are we doing versus the competition? Because today, you know, you can compete on price, you can compete on product, but you need to compete on a different level. Because if you, if you don't have a different advantage, uh, you know, I, one dealer told me a long time ago, people buy from people, people buy more from people they like. And, and today, <laughs> if you don't provide that value, you know, people will buy from somebody else. Well, it's nice that you um, 
I don't know of many companies that actually will bring in their clients, their mm -hmm. customers, their builders, their vendors to share the other side of the fence with the sales force and the mm -hmm. company itself. To hear those stories, like you said, good, bad, or ugly, yeah. uh, as long as the people you bring in are completely transparent, you know, they Correct. tell the good, the bad, and the ugly, yep. um, and they don't just, you know, pander to the audience, but they, they tell the real. That's a, a high level of credibility for you and them because they realize that you want to get better. You want to be the best you can be. Yeah. It's such a powerful tool. Uh, I, I mean, I remember... I'm trying to remember now, six or seven years ago, we we launched a new program concept in Canada two years before the U.S., and, and we weren't getting buy-in from our field sales team. They were like, uh, it's way too complicated. And we asked a dealer um, to come down from Canada that had been using the program for a couple of years. And we said, you know, would you just come in and just tell us what you think of it? Be totally candid. Uh, he was on the whiteboard for like two hours. And, wow. and he, he basically convinced everybody in the room, this is the easiest program to sell. You guys need to look at it differently. Look at it from the dealer perspective and not from your perspective because you're looking at it from a the complexity side. I'm looking at it from a dollars and cents. I got to make a few minor tweaks on my decision making and I can make a lot of money. And that's what we were missing because we can tell our salespeople that they, didn't, they weren't buying it. They weren't believing us. The fact that they heard it from a dealer, from an actual customer that had lived it, breathed it, and made some buying decisions that really rewarded him at the end of the year, they were, they were rare to go. And they were basically just itching to get out in the field. And now they have a testimonial that they can use to talk to the other yep. dealers in their yep. areas. Smart thinking there. So we have one last one here, and then we'll open up if you have any questions. Um, your any additional thoughts that you can think of for best practices for managers in across the board, any industry or yours, either one, but any, any additional thoughts? Don't get stale. It's too easy to get complacent, sit back, things are rolling, and just let them roll. You, you have to keep moving forward. Um, your competition's going to keep moving forward. The industry is going to continue to change. And as the industry changes, you got to change because in many cases, you didn't even realize the industry took a, a left turn and you're still going straight. Um, so you, you got to keep your finger on the pulse. You got to keep on changing it up and you have to keep people energized uh, because it's too easy to get complacent. And when you get complacent, your team gets complacent and then your customers start looking elsewhere. So it's just very, very important. Kind of reminds me of uh, when uh, Aaron Rodgers is, is winning a game. You, you don't slow slow down and, and no. play defense. You you put put the foot on, put the foot on the gas and you pour yeah. it on, right? Absolutely. You can't you can't back off because unfortunately your team does back off, and then you got to get them excited again. And sometimes that can take a while. So uh, that, need... that's the one thing I drive into my direct reports all the time. Let's keep moving. Let's keep changing changing it up because otherwise people will get bored. Yeah, they need to teach the Detroit Lions that philosophy. <laughs> well, that sounds great. Do you have any questions for me, Randy, at all as we're going through this? No, none for me. All right. Well, thank you, folks. This is, uh, this is the end of our discussion with Randy Caruana from Wisconsin uh, with Mercury Marine. Randy, we really appreciate you coming on. This is Continuous Sales Improvement for sales managers, best practices. Hope you enjoyed our show today. Thanks again, Randy. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you Thanks, next sir. week. Have a great day. Bye-bye now. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to subscribe to get notified of the latest episode. Also, to learn more about improving your sales team, visit continuous com. See you in the next episode and have a great day.